morning we are continuing our study in the, the imprecatory psalms and today it's a prayer. A lot of times I think people don't always realize that that psalms are also prayers and this is one of David's prayers uh, Psalm 17 so let's let's let us pray first before we begin. Father, we thank you for this opportunity again to come together uh, to read your word, to be to not just gain understanding, but gain closeness to you, and uh, to understand uh, ourselves better through your eyes. And uh, Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Psalm 17. It's uh, 15 verses. And, uh, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and read it. This is a literal translation of the psalm. So you'll, you'll notice if you're reading along in an English version uh, that there are differences from what is literally said. Hear, O Jehovah, righteousness. Listen to my cry. Give ear to my prayer not in lips of deceit. Now what David's saying there is he's, he's praying and he's not deceiving anybody. He's not deceiving God. He's, he's telling it like it is. Verse 2. Let my judgment go out from your presence. Your eyes see uprightly. You will test my heart. You will visit in the night. You will try me, and we're going to look at this phrase about being tried a little bit later. You will try me, and you will find nothing. My thoughts do not go beyond my mouth, and we'll talk about that phrase too. As to the work of men, by the words of your lips I keep from the paths of the violent. My steps have kept in your tracks so that my feet have not slipped. I called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Bow down your ear to me. Hear my word. Set out your wonderful loving kindness. Now that word loving kindness is the word chesed, uh, and we'll talk about that. Set out your wonderful loving kindness, O Savior of the trusters in you. I love that phrase, the Savior of the trusters in you. By your right hand, from those who withstand you. So, O Savior of the trusters in you, by your right hand, from those who uh, withstand you or stand against you. Keep me as the pupil, the daughter of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked's face who stripped me, my enemies against my soul, encircle me. They, now he's talking about his enemies, they are enclosed in their fat. Their mouth speaks proudly. Our steps, they have now encircled us. They set their eyes to cast me to the earth like a lion who is greedy to tear and as a young lion sitting in hidden dens. Arise, O Jehovah, go before his face, bow him down, deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword. From men, by your hand, O Jehovah, from men of the world, whose portion is in this life, and their belly you fill with your treasure. They are satisfied with sons, and will leave their riches to their babes. As for me, I will look on your face in righteousness. When I awaken, I shall be satisfied by your image. Now as I mentioned before, this is a prayer of David. 
and uh, most of the commentators that I looked at agreed that it was probably when he was being pursued uh, by King Saul and uh, his life was in danger. Saul wanted to kill him and his men that he had with him wanted to kill him. Um, and what he is saying here is that there isn't any insincerity in David in, in this prayer. He's being straight with God. He's being sincere. He's telling him exactly what's on his heart. And by the way, that's the way we always ought to pray. None of us should ever think that we can fool God into thinking something about ourselves because he looks at our hearts. He knows what we're really feeling and what we really want. Uh, and, and if we are wanting something we know we shouldn't want, we can, you know, I would tell you, well, if you're going to tell him that you want something and you know you shouldn't, you should tell him, Lord, you know what I want and you know I shouldn't want it. Uh, at least be honest with him about it. Um, now, in in uh, verse three, it says, uh, "You will try me." Now, I found this one interesting because it is um, it is made up of a word that uh, that some of you probably already know. It's seraphtani, seraphtani. Now that word seraph, you know, uh, many of our hymns will talk about the seraphim. Well, the seraphim is is an the eternal creature that God created, and the literal translation of a seraph uh, is or a seraphim is burning ones. Seraph means to burn with fire, and so uh, David is saying. Uh, God, I know you're going to put me to the test the way that metals are tested. You, you test gold and silver by heating it up and putting a fire under it and so that all the dross, the, the contaminants, float to the surface and they can be skimmed off. And, and folks, that's what God does with us. Um, you and I both know we are full of contaminants. Uh, and uh, and the sooner that we confess that and own up to it, the better we're going to be. That doesn't mean that we won't continue to be tested and tried. We will, but it'll make the testing uh, more understandable. I will put it that way. I won't say it's it won't make it easier, but it'll make it more understandable. And to me, if I understand something. Um, it, it makes things uh, uh, better uh, to me. So, um, let's see, where was I? Okay. Um, look at verse 4 there. As to the work of men, by the words of your lips, I keep from the paths of the violent. Um, David knows that the violent, which is what we have in our worth, all uh, our world, all over the place these days, we are just absolutely surrounded by people who are. Um, uh, doing violence. I mean, uh, we see all these uh, rumors of wars over in uh, uh, the oh, in Russia, Ukraine. We know that they are, uh, we hear rumors of wars over about Taiwan, and, and there's probably an awful lot of places that you and I just don't know anything about because the news media and the government won't tell us. But uh, there's, there's violence everywhere. And then there's violence against people who are um, uh, trying to stand up against tyranny in their countries. Think of our neighbors to the north. Uh, and uh, uh, But they're being done violence, evil violence, by uh, this little dictator up there. And uh, we have a lot of would-be dictators in our own country. Every country has people that would love to be dictators, and they're evil, they're wicked people. But David is saying that while he's been kept from 
the paths of the violent, he realizes that that's not that's really not enough. Uh, in verse five, he says, "My steps have kept in your tracks." In other words, he knows that it's not just enough to be uh, to avoid doing things the way the wicked do it, but we have to do things the way God wants us to do it, and that's by walking in His steps. And of course, uh, we know the book the. Uh, in his steps, uh, and uh, we know there's a there's a, some poems that have been written in recent years about the steps of Christ on a beach, and uh, so we have to be in obedience to God's will, and that means not just avoiding doing bad things, but purposely doing the things God wants us to do. And you say, well, what kind of things is that? Well, if you know somebody that's lost, you need to ask God how to share the gospel with that person. Uh, it's, it's not enough to, to avoid doing bad things. We need to be doing God's mission here. Uh, Christ mission. You know that the church is called the body of Christ. We literally are his hands and, and feet that people can see. And that's a kind of a frightening thing to think about it when we realize how tarnished our hands and feet and our voices and, and manners are. But, but that's the fact. We are, uh, we are his body. Then drop down to verse 7. Uh, David remarks about God's wonderful loving kindness. Um, it's, uh, in Hebrew, it's haple kasadeka. Uh, probably murdering that uh, Hebrew. Uh, but uh, it means that God is doing wonders of Chesed, which is the Old Testament version of the New Testament grace. Um, uh, loving kindness is one of David's favorite uh, uh, words. In fact, you will find the Psalms uh, are where most of the places where you find the word loving kindness is in the Psalms. So it was one of David's favorite words, and it's grace. Remember, we're told in the New Testament, by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of your own. So, uh, that grace is something that David was keenly aware of. Even though he, this was in the Old Testament days, he still understood God's grace. And then he uses a, a term that, that I really love, Savior of trusters in you. That's who God is. He is not the savior of everybody. He is only the savior of those who trust in him. Do you do that? Do you trust in him? Uh, I was watching an old uh, Tom Selleck movie recently, and in the beginning of it, uh, the the wife of the uh, of the character is uh, listening to one of her children read the Bible and he's talking about um, Methuselah and how old Methuselah was. And the, ch the child asks a question and she says, oh, it's just a story. Now, sadly, there's an awful lot of people who call themselves Christians and go to churches and uh, probably the vast majority of them and they just regard everything in the Bible that they don't understand as something that's just a story. And um, all I can say is it goes back to faith. What I said a few minutes ago, we are saved by grace through faith. If you don't believe, then there isn't any grace for you. You're not a truster in the one who can save you. And, uh, and that's what trusting means, believing what he says in his word. Um, and then in, uh, drop down to verse 11, he starts talking about this one particular enemy that is, 
that um, he he makes it plural when he says our steps they have now encircled us uh, that seems to, again to be an indication that David is not just praying for himself but the men that are with him that are that are have attached themselves to David because they know he's the king that God wants uh, that Saul's been rejected as king uh, and so they are his court as it were uh, the the mighty men uh, that followed David to protect him, his his bodyguard, his uh, encouragement, and uh, and that um, where it says our steps, Asherin, Asherinu, uh, the new part is is the plural ours, and. Um, what what is being said here where it says um, they set their eyes to cast me to the earth uh, what he's saying here is that even though he's praying for the protection of of all of them together that David is the prize David is the one that Saul wants to get. He doesn't really care about the others in so far as uh, that he's worried about them. He just knows that they're helping David. But he wants David cast to the earth. And <clears throat> I was reading it in um, Adam Clark's commentary. And he said something that's kind of interesting that I thought <coughs> excuse me, was, was interesting. He said, the attitude of the huntsman uh, looking for the track of the uh, heart or the deer or the antelope, uh, the, their foot on the ground, they make a particular kind of track that, they, that they're looking for. And that's, that's what David is describing. He's saying, I'm being hunted like um, a, 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 a pre, by a prey. Uh, uh, as a, as a person of prey, and um, then uh, so that's what he's describing there in in uh, verse eleven, and uh, and then in verse twelve he he says that uh, uh, his um, opponent is like a greedy lion. He's just waiting to tear him to pieces. Is what he's saying. And you know that's some of, one of the things that I've noticed about cats is that they like to torment uh, their prey. Uh, I have found outside my house field mice before, and you can tell that they've been tormented. And then finally, the cat gets tired and just kills it. You know, it bites it in the head or the neck or something like that. Uh, but uh, but that's one of the things about cats. They they enjoy tormenting uh, their prey. I I don't know why. Uh, I guess that's part of the fact that they're in a fallen world and they're showing uh, the fallenness that's spread to them. Um, verse thirteen, David says. Arise, O Jehovah, go before his face. That's the enemy's face. Bow him down. Bow the enemy down. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword. Well, you know, that's kind of an interesting thought, too. Um, in our world today, the beast of the earth, and I've mentioned this before, in uh, Daniel describes the powers that be, the governments that rule on the earth, they are beasts. Uh, now they may be men, but they act like beasts. They act like that cruel cat that likes to torment. And, and we're going through that in our world today, and especially here in the last few months we've seen a lot of torment uh, directed toward the people of these governments. It doesn't matter what government we're talking about. They're all pretty much the same. Um, and David's appeal is to the hand of God. Uh, and God's hand is powerful. His arm is 
stronger than anybody or any combination of buddies, uh, whether they're heavenly beings or earthly. It, uh, none are a match for him. Um, but what we need to remember as Christians is that God's sword is... It's, it's the same, but it's different to us. It, it, we can read in Jeremiah 47, 6, um, O sword of Jehovah, until when will you not be quiet? Put yourself into your sheath. Rest and be still. Now, I'm sure that Jeremiah, if you read the rest of that passage, that he is talking about... Um, uh, vindication against some of the enemies of Israel, some of the surrounding nations. But in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, we know this, for living is the word of God and efficient and sharper than every two-edged sword, even penetrating to the division both of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So what is the sword of God? His word. I again ask Christians, how well do you know his word? You know, if when Jesus was being tempted by the enemy, Jesus used the sword against Satan and he beat him back. Now, Satan knows God's word too because he tried to, to use uh, God's word to convince Jesus to do something wrong and he was misapplying it. And folks, we have plenty of preachers and laymen that will misapply God's word. That's why you have to study it you have to ask for discernment from God. Uh, you need to ask the Spirit, who is the author of God's Word, his, uh, what he meant by what, he, what we read. Um, and, and that requires a lifetime of doing that. So if you haven't started, you better get started now because things are just going to get worse in this world before the Lord takes us all home. Now verse 14, he says, From men by your hand, O Jehovah, from men of the world, whose portion is this life. Uh, Memethim Mekeled, mortal men of time. Men who shift with the times. Boy, does that ever describe politicians? Uh, the, they'll say one thing one day and something else the next day and they just keep they keep putting their finger up in the air and find out which way the wind is blowing. Now, I've seen a lot of preachers that way. I've seen lots of people that way. Uh, a lot of church members that way. Why are they that way? Because they have no fixed principle except for one. And their principle is securing their own interest making sure that they get what they want. And then he says something kind of interested, interesting. They are satisfied with sons. Now what did David mean by that? Well, he means that they have plenty of children to inherit what treasures they have. And, you know, I take this in a little different way than some of the other... Uh, people that were writing their commentaries, but I, what I got to thinking of is, uh, how does evil spread? Well, it, it spreads by children learning the evil of their fathers. And one of those people I think about that is Bill Gates. His father, you go look it up sometime about what the things his father said and, and practiced, and you'll find out now why that the uh, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And in verse 15, David says, As for me, I will look on your face. Now, folks, the only person that's ever going to see God 
is someone God has declared righteous. And the only way that you get declared righteous today is through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And Him only. No one else. Just Him. Nothing can satisfy the wishes of an immortal spirit except God. That was from Adam Clark. I like that. And I think that's a good way for us to close um, this uh, study this morning. Father, we thank you for um, the fact that you, you will satisfy us. We will see you one day. We don't deserve to see you, but because you've declared us righteous by the, the grace and faith that you've given to us, uh, we will see you one day, and that will satisfy us. That will satisfy us all the pain and suffering that we've had to go through here. Or we'll be satisfied. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.